Well, thank you very much uh, for your introduction, and thank you for coming. Uh, I have a PowerPoint that I want to narrate uh, on my perspectives on the Holocaust, Israel, and Palestine. So I'll begin at the beginning, and then we'll have times for comments and questions. This is me in 1990 when I first came to Denison. I look pretty good. Uh, younger. And in 1990, I was invited primarily for my book, Toward a Jewish Theology of Liberation, which was published in 1987. And in 1989, there was a new edition of my book with a new final chapter on the Palestinian uprising, which began after the publication of my book, but with it, in the end of 1987 and 1988, there was a tremendous international concern, both about Israel and the Palestinians. Palestinians were fighting for their state, and Israel, not all Jews and not all Jewish Israelis, but the state of Israel opposed that state. And then I had just written and published Beyond Innocence and Redemption, Confronting the Holocaust in Israeli Power. That was 1990, published as I came here. And if you look at the Denison newspaper, there's a write-up about my presence here, which talks about the lecture and about the book. So 1990 was a very important time for me as a Jew, for Israel, and for Palestine. And there was a real struggle, a tremendous amount of suffering, a lot of solidarity across lines between Jews and Palestinians, and a lot of violence. Today, there's a lot less hope. And I'm going to talk about that uh, this evening. Well, Dr. David Woodyard, who's here, invited me in 1990, and he's still teaching. So I want to thank him, because even then I was controversial, because I was saying that for Jews, the central question of our community life in history was the Palestinian people. And I said directly, and I wrote directly, we as Jews cannot be free until Palestinians are free. So as a person dedicated for many, many years, his whole life, to a solidarity with the Jewish people, Dr. Woodyard saw that my speech about Palestinians was also profoundly Jewish. So I'm grateful for that invitation and for his presence throughout his life as a person who has dedicated himself to a solidarity with the Jewish people, which it also includes Palestinian freedom. Now here we are in 2019. When I got the invitation, I called my older son, Aaron, and I said to him, can you believe it? 19 years after I was invited to speak, I was invited again. Because I always say, don't worry if you're going to be invited back. I can't speak the truth if I'm worried about that. I like to be invited back. And he said to me, he calls me Dad E. Dad E, it was 29 years ago. <laughs> so since then, a lot's happened, and I'll be speaking about that. But here is my latest book, Finding Our Voice, Embodying the Prophetic, and other misadventures. Not adventures, they are adventures, but misadventures. Because if you're going to speak the truth, even against a majority of your community, you're going to get hit and hit hard. And I know all of you have come here and your parents have sent you here to be successful. Be wary of success without conscience. And this is the Filipino edition of my book, Finding Our Voice, and the cover is very interesting. Here you have a militarized figure in the U.S. edition, and the Filipinos tend to be happier than we are. And I consider that a very happy cover. 
if you read the book. And my latest, which will be come out, come out uh, in December or January, is a devotional that I've written, I Am Who Loves the Prophets. If you've read the Bible, you know that God is never named. The Jewish tradition, you cannot name God. So God is I Am. And in the Hebrew Bible, I am who will be. But I believe that God has a special love for the prophets of all religions and those with no religion. And that is the place where I live in Cape Canaveral, three blocks from the beach. And I go to this, I call this my chapel of love. And I go to this every morning at sunrise, and I spend some time, I sometimes write, and I say my prayer, thanking God for awakening me to this day. I've also started, to bring you up to date, a center for the study of the global prophetic, which right now is wherever I am. But I'm hoping that some institution might also invite me and my center to be where they are. And the idea is here that the prophetic, that is the prophets in the Bible, is the indigenous of Jewish. That's our indigenous. We can discuss this as I go on. But the prophetic has been spread around the world through Christianity and Islam and other religions. So there's a prophetic wherever you go. What is your prophetic? What is your prophetic? We can learn from each other to deepen the prophetic in our global world with the crises that we face, which are many and which you are learning about at Denison. Well, here is Dr. Christine Pei, the chair of the Department of Religion, who used my book, Jews of Conscience, in her course. And we've given her a copy of the Philippine edition of Finding Our Voice. So I thank you for inviting me. And here's their class today. Very interesting class. And in fact, they had actually read my book. I thought to myself, my God, what's happening? Now, the book, this book is only about 35 pages, let's be honest. It's a series of my lectures, but they had read the book and had interesting comments and questions. Thank you for that. Now, here are my two uh, children, Aaron on the left and Isaiah on the right. And it's very much Aaron's view and Isaiah's view. And I want you to read you Definitions of the prophetic that both of them have written. Because in Jewish life, the prophetic has been passed down. I inherited the prophetic. They inherit the prophetic. Their children will inherit the prophetic. Now, you know in the Bible, the prophets are called by God to go to Israel that has strayed from God's commands. And the prophets are called to go out to the people and say, You've strayed from God's commands. Watch out. Return to justice. And it's justice for the poor, for the widow, for the orphan, for those who are considered strangers as we were in the land of Egypt. But that prophetic has been passed down. And here is Aaron's definition. Indeed, I have inherited an interpretive framework and existential directedness, a way of life toward which I can strive. I have been given the tools which I may now seek an intentional orientation toward myself, toward various communities, in my own included, not just to others, but mine, toward others, toward the other, capital O, toward the divine, small d, toward the world. Now, I spend a lot of time trying to figure out what my sons write about various topics, including about me. And it's a fascinating definition 
of the prophetic, and it's actually a better definition than I've been able to write in 27 books. So there it goes. And here's Isaiah with the middle name, also Dylan, a modern-day Jewish prophet, Bob Dylan. Ancient, modern. Truly to grapple with our simultaneous entanglement across space and time, with power and with the unempowered, seems tantamount to relearning the vital functions offered to the affluent and the privileged, which we all are in this room, being a denizen. One of the vital functions of affluence is staying put, mapping one's life from beginning to end before it has happened, to make a future, to make it an object and work on it, is often not possible within the prophetic framework. It is the prophetic call to think beginnings without a future. Interesting. It's fascinating for me. I hope for you. The prophets are announcing a future for the Jewish people of justice. We've got to move there. And what Isaiah is saying is we have to give everything to the present, not worry about the future. The future will come into being if we are faithful to the prophetic and to those who are suffering. Well, we could spend the whole time on these two quotes, and I've spent a lot of time, two definitions of the prophetic. Oh, there's my bar mitzvah picture. Okay, I just want, uh, we, we, we can laugh. I was 13, like most Jews, became a bar mitzvah, and that's how I posed for my photograph. And then my mother said, smile. <laughs> now, you can judge which is better. I like the first one. That's more me, but I do smile, but usually not on command unless my mother tells me to. Okay, mapping after the Holocaust. We're getting there. Maps are crucial if we look at maps as a report on our personal and collective condition, we can visualize where we are. Looking at previous maps in relation to present ones, we can appreciate where we have come from. Then we can map where we want to be in the future. This is for personal life. Where were we? Where were you three years ago? In actual life, physically, emotionally, relationally. Where are you now? We can conceptualize, I'm a really good person. But we may have done some things that weren't so good. Is that on our map, or do we just show the map that we, uh, to others that we want to see and to ourselves? The sign of maturity is to take the maps that don't look so good and say, they're also part of me and part of us. Right. We usually try to hide that from ourselves and from others. Now, most of you have, have done nothing wrong in your life, but when you get to my age, you have, all of you. At some point, we have to look at what we've done that's good, not so good, and even bad. And what do we do with that? So this is about mapping Jewish identity in our time through the Holocaust, through Israel, and Palestine. And of course, we're coming up to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, which is a time for Jews. It starts at the end of this week. It's a time of reckoning for Jews. And it's a time of judgment, we believe, by God. Now, all of the Jews in this room will survive God's judgment. We survive every year. But the idea is, is that we're looking into ourselves and looking into our community and saying, what's good, what's wrong? And here's the confession I gave in 1990, and I'm going to give to you tonight. It's a very controversial con confession. I give it every speech I've given, every lecture since 1987, even when they ask me to talk on a subject that is completely unrelated, I'm going to get it in. And here it is. <clears throat> What we as Jews have done to you, the Palestinian people, 
is wrong. What we as Jews are doing to you, the Palestinian people, is wrong. Does that mean that Jews and Judaism is rotten? Not at all. Do we want to get into these conceptual categories of Jewish conspiracy and Jewish? No. Wrong. What we are doing to Palestinians is actually wrong. That doesn't mean Israel shouldn't exist if you want a Jewish state. It doesn't mean that Israel is only bad. This is not my point. What we have done and what we are doing to the Palestinian people is wrong. It needs to be corrected. That's the confession we need to make. The map that we don't want to see and we don't want others to see. And we'll go through maps, actual maps, of what we're doing that's wrong. So we deal with the Holocaust first, and this was my teacher, Richard Rubenstein, who wrote the book after Auschwitz. It's very important to recall the Holocaust and the consciousness and theology that came out of the Holocaust for what it mapped our suffering and what it didn't map Palestinian suffering. And this whole idea, and you may have read this term after Auschwitz, After Auschwitz, what should Jews be about? Where was humanity while Jews were being systematically murdered in Europe? After Auschwitz, Auschwitz was a breaking point in human history, many Jews believe. What are we going to do? And Rubenstein said that, for instance, we could no longer believe in the God of history as we once did. God liberated us from Egypt. God was with us. We were God's people. But where was God at Auschwitz? How many of you have read Elie Wiesel's Night? Okay. Okay. That's a book about where was God at Auschwitz. Now, some of my evangelical students at Baylor, when I taught there, was very concerned that Elie Wiesel might have lost his faith. Rubenstein did. He could no longer, he didn't say that God didn't exist because the covenant was between God and the Jewish people. God had certain responsibility. The Jewish people had certain responsibility. God often judged us for not doing what we were supposed to do. But then we had a discussion with God. Where were you? So after the Holocaust, Rubenstein said, that the covenant with God was broken. Now, I was 17, 18 years old listening to him. And today, teachers are very much counseled to make you feel good and not to offend. Not in my generation. Rubenstein announced the broken covenant and said, Mark, tough, think about it. Actually, he called me Mr. Ellis. He didn't give me a hug. Here's the cunning of history. After Auschwitz was published in 1966, this is 1975, where Rubenstein says not that the Holocaust was only about Jews, but that the 20th century was a century of mass death. There was progress, but if you look at the episodes of mass death and you think, well, that was an aberration, that was an aberration, That was, we're getting better and better. That was, Rubenstein said, no. Progress and mass death come together. And that's true in the 21st century, too. He was not a happy warrior, Rubenstein. It was a very tragic sense of the world. And he believed that history was a cycle of violence and atrocity without end. You either had power or you were going to be hit hard. So Jews needed power. Because when we didn't have power, we were annihilated. And the annihilation happened in the land of Luther, that is in a Christian civilization. Europe was, or supposedly was. It wasn't just bad Nazis. 
Millions of Europeans didn't want Jews, and there was a theology that supported that anti-Semitism, which he called the night side of the Judeo-Christian tradition, this violence. But his main point was Jews needed Jewish power, and that power was to be found in the state of Israel. And Rubenstein was very honest. He would say, look, Jews didn't have power. We were almost annihilated. We need power. Palestinians have been wrong, tough. We need power. Because if you don't have power, you're dead. And listening to Rubenstein as a young person and as a young Jew, I said, I can't dispute what he's saying. I can't live it either. Now, Elie Wiesel's night is about a shattered world, and I would say a new Kaddish. The Kaddish is the prayer said over the dead in Jewish funerals, and it never mentions death. But if you look at night and you read it, it's really a liturgical book. It's like a religious service, but not with a positive outcome. It's all about death. And Wiesel also thought the covenant was broken like Rubenstein, but we could keep the covenant of the past. It was a past event that stayed with us, but it was now a covenant of mourning. The God who was with us, but is no longer. How many of you have been to the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C.? Okay. Well, there are two parts to the museum. One is Wiesel's part. Remember the part where the photos of the villages rise? And it's a very, it's like a void of Jews who are no longer with us. And then there's a part which announces the systematic death of Jews. The difficult part of the visualization comes from Eli Wiesel. The systematic death comes from Richard Rubenstein. There were two sides of the Holocaust. And the Holocaust Museum is about memory, testimony, and witness. But Palestinians are never mentioned. Jews are, correctly, but there's something else that we're doing now. And that is causing the suffering of Palestinians. And the museum is really an unsettled argument about the Holocaust and God. You want a museum to be seamless. You have one view and you go through, but actually the Holocaust Museum has two views and they clash. Here's another one, Emil Fackenheim. These were the Holocaust theologians, Wiesel, Rubinstein, now Fackenheim. And he believed that there had been a 614th commandment. In Orthodox Jewish life, there are 613 commandments. But in the 1967 war, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes, when Israel felt that it was being threatened, and many Jews around the world felt that it was being threatened by Arab countries, Jews rose up and the Israeli army rose up and defeated the Arab nations. Now, the 67 war is very complex, and we can talk about that too in our conversation, but this is what many Jews felt. And Fackenheim believed that the Jewish response for empowerment was a new commandment that didn't come from God, it came from the Jewish people. The authentic Jew of today is forbidden to hand Hitler yet another posthumous victory. In other words, Jews were saying, according to Fackenheim, this time we're going to fight, not like the Holocaust. It was very strong, even today, in the Jewish community and in Israel. This is part of the Jewish conversation about Israel and Palestine. You think, let's just take Israel and Palestine by itself. But it's shadowed by the Holocaust and what many Jews believe are the lessons of the Holocaust. But maybe there are other lessons too. 
which is what I will continue to talk about in a, in a while. Now here's another Holocaust theologian, Rabbi Irving Greenberg, and the most devastating statement, this was in the 1970s, about it, is made by him. After the Holocaust, no statement, theological or otherwise, should be made that would not be credible in the presence of the burning children. If you want to talk about God, if it makes sense to a burning child, because many of the children were burned in pits by the Nazis, if it wouldn't make sense to a burning child, don't say it. If it would make sense, you can talk about God, the goodness of God, the power of God. But if it wouldn't make sense, be silent. Now that, that would end our seminaries, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim. It's an impossible statement. Because what would make sense to a burning child about God? So Holocaust theology, as I'm critical for the questions it misses, speaks profoundly about the absence of God. And here, about moment faiths. We talk about theism, I'm a believer in God, you're an atheist. Greenberg says, after the Holocaust, no. After Auschwitz, we now have to speak of moment faiths, moments when Redeemer and vision of redemption are present, interspersed with times when the flames and smoke of burning children blot out faith, though it flickers again. All of us believers have an atheism within us. And Greenberg believes that atheists also have a belief within them. It's no longer, I'm a believer in God or Jesus, or I'm a faithful Muslim and you're not. All of us have this inside of us after the Holocaust. Uh, but even in the 1970s, Greenberg, who was an ardent supporter of Israel, said this, the victims ask us above anything else not to allow the creation of another matrix of values that might sustain another attempt at genocide. We have to be careful after the Holocaust, and here to Jews especially. The Holocaust cannot be used for triumphalism. Its moral challenge must also be applied to Jews. So Greenberg says, as an Orthodox rabbi, we have a right to be empowered, but not to use more power than we need. If we go over that limit, we're transgressing what we learned from the Holocaust. This was a warning about Jewish power vis-a-vis -vis Palestinians. We have a right to power, Greenberg says, but not to use more power than necessary. And here's one of his pamphlets from 1980. And here are two other figures, and you might know of them. How many of you have heard of Hannah Arendt? Okay, Martin Buber. Okay, well, they were two very famous 20th century Jews from Germany, Austria, German-speaking. Both Hannah Arendt and Martin Buber were specifically Jewish. They both escaped from the Holocaust. And whereas the Holocaust thinkers all felt that Israel, whatever they believed about God, that empowerment in Israel was central to Jewish identity in the future, these two very well-known Jews said, we can have a homeland in Palestine right next to and with a homeland of Arabs in Palestine. They were both against, now this is, you're going to think, no, no, this is impossible now, but they were both against the establishment of the state of Israel. They were very pro-Jewish, but they thought that the creation of a state of Israel would force Israel to expel Arabs from Palestine, which it did. It would create animosity for generations 
between Jews and Arabs, which it did. And it would be a form of violence used by Jews, which would then have to come into the Jewish community, and we would have to be mobilized for violence as Jews, which we hadn't been before. So Zionism in the creation of the state of Israel was very complex, many different parts. We had state Zionism, which won, but we also had a spiritual and homeland Zionism. They were Zionists. They believed in Jewish settlement in Palestine, but not a Jewish state. An argument which has come back again in the Jewish community in Israel, and outside of Israel, including in the United States. And by the way, they were not shy about it. They wrote about it, and Martin Buber used to meet with the first prime minister of Israel, David Ben-Gurion, and excoriate him about the way Israel was treating Arabs. He would lecture him. So this was a very public dispute, which many Jews today don't know anything about don't know that it existed. The 67 war, very important because Israel had been created and had expelled in that creation about 750,000 Palestinians. We would call it today ethnic cleansing. And in the 67 war, Israel won more territory which it now occupies. This is a very current discussion, which started back in 1967 and after the war. After the war, which Israel won decisively, there were some Jews who wanted to settle in parts of Jerusalem, the West Bank, and Gaza. And other Jews said, don't go there, come back. We won the war. Let's create a Palestinian state. But we know what won. The settlements, which have grown and grown and grown. So the 1967 war was very, very important. And in the 67 war, many Jews in Israel and Jews in America, I was one of them, thought that we were innocent. We had been threatened. We won. We now have power. It's important that Jews defend themselves. Many Jews didn't think about what was happening to Palestinians. And some Jews didn't care. And the victory was seen, this is another, it's very maybe difficult for you to see this today. Jews of my generation didn't think that the Israeli army was like any other army. We didn't like to fight, we didn't want to fight, we fought clean, unlike other armies. But the reality is, an army is an army. And even the occupation of Palestinians, we thought was not going to continue, and that we were doing good for Palestinians. But an occupation of another people is an occupation of another people. In other words, Jews in my generation felt that we were good and just, and we were innocent. And we were in many ways. But we've also created another reality where we're not doing good, when we're not doing just, and we are not innocent. So here are some very important figures that are part of the Jewish conversation even today. Rubinstein, Wiesel, Greenberg, Fackenheim, Hannah Arendt, and Martin Buber. When I was growing up, the Holocaust wasn't named as central to Jewish identity, nor was Israel. We both knew both of them existed, but they were in the background. After the 67 war, they became central to Jewish identity. But after that Holocaust was named, we began to understand that Israel was more complicated through the continuing occupation, the Lebanon war in the 1980s, and the Palestinian uprising, and its crushing by Israel in the late 80s, early 90s. 
But our community leadership said we have to keep going. And so we were undergoing what Irving Greenberg called the difficult task of normalization. That we felt as Jews that we were special, but we had to have power. When you have power, you can't be special. We have to accept the fact that we now have power and that sometimes we're going to do things that are wrong, but, Greenberg says, we're not like everyone else. How much better can we be and survive? And Greenberg went through a formula. Could we be 90% better? 80% better? 70? He ended up 10% better. Very Jewish. We had to be better, but if we were too much better, we wouldn't survive. So the prophetic is de-emphasized. Our indigenous has to be put down so we can be normal. But the prophetic is our indigenous. It keeps coming back. And right now, it's exploding in the Jewish world. Okay. Now we're getting to the mapping. That's some background. I want to show you, before we get to the detailed maps, some of the visual representations of the fence, the barrier, and the wall that was created around 2000 and on by Israel to separate, to take more land, to make Palestinian life more difficult, and to protect Jews from Palestinians. So here's the fence, which is cut through Palestinian land, where Palestinians can't get to their land or come over. Barriers, roads for Jews only in the occupied territories. Whole Palestinian cities surrounded by a wall, or a fence, or a barrier, all three. Now, you can see this fence. This is not the fence that I used to climb over to play baseball. This is a fence where there are monitors, trenches, and monitors away where they can see anything that's happening and act upon it. These are Palestinian olive trees being uprooted, olive trees for Palestinians being a source of farming, but also a symbol of their life on the land. Just been announced that there are going to be 2,000 olive trees uh, destroyed by Israel around Bethlehem. So this is a, a moneymaker, a land, and a symbol that's systematically destroyed by Israel. And here is the wall pictures of it. Guarded by Israeli soldiers, parts of it. This is no longer there, but in Bethlehem, which has traditionally been a Christian city, Israel put this wall, this sign up, peace be with you as you entered Bethlehem, but it was an occupied war zone. This is a picture photo I took. Now here's a map. This is where we're going to get into details because when we talk about Israel and Palestine, Palestine, we're talking about usually conceptual. We have concepts pro, for, against, and you know we have all the, and we have a lot of emotion. So I want to just show you some maps. 1947. This is before the state of Israel is created. This is Palestine. And the Jewish settlements are in white. There were Jews in Palestine forever. And more Jews came in the end of the 19th century, early part of the 20th century, and then after the Holocaust. There's the partition plan that the UN put into place, or wanted to put into place, where you would have Israel in white, and Palestine in green. Of course, Palestinians asked, why are you giving land to Jews? It's our land collectively, including with Jews. 
Here's from 1949 to 1967. You have Israel, and remember here, about 750,000 Palestinians were driven out into the West Bank and into Gaza and outside, too, into Lebanon and Syria. And here is the present. This is a few years ago. This is Israel. And this is Palestine, and here's Israel, too. So you can see this is called the disappearing Palestine, but it's also the continual expansion of Israel. And in the West Bank, we'll have some more maps in a moment, you have no contiguous part of the West Bank either because you have Israeli settlements and soldiers all through this area. And then Gaza, which has been in the news much over the last, we'll talk a little bit about that too, uh, is completely separated. Okay, I'm going to show you a few maps, and it's going to be very repetitive, which is the point. This is the agreed-upon two-state solution internationally. This will be Israel, and this will be Palestine with a shared Jerusalem and a connector to Gaza. Now, we could argue about whether it's fair or not. There are many arguments, but this is the international consensus of how the Israeli-Palestinian crisis can be solved. We have Israel, and we have Palestine with a connector. Oslo happened in 1993, which was an agreement between the Palestinian Authority and Israel about how we could move toward a solution of the Israeli-Palestinian crisis. And that was basically Israel here, and that this would eventually become all of Palestine. But in the beginning, we would have Palestinians controlling the dark brown, and Israel and Palestinians controlling the light brown areas, which would eventually go back to Palestine. And in the beginning, this would be Israel in the West Bank. Here is Israel as a state, and Israel would remain for some time in the West Bank, but look where it remains, on the borders, and in between. But eventually, this dark brown and light brown would become one, and eventually Israel would leave. That was the hope, the West Bank. And the West Bank and Gaza would become a Palestinian state sharing Jerusalem. Here's a map a few years later. The West Bank, here's Israel here, and you have the West Bank, and again you see Israel is controlling the borders. These are settlements that will grow, and so you'll have a map that's light brown and, say, blue, and Israel will be there. Again, the hope was still that Israel would withdraw. Here's a map in 2000. Here's Palestine. Here's Israel. Here are the settlements that will become blue all through here. Here's Israel. This is in the West Bank, where millions of Palestinians live. So that Palestinians would be segmented, surrounded by Israeli power. 2001. Now, I don't even have to use laser point here, right? It's the same map. Now, this is a Jewish group, a dissident group, who drew what they thought would be the map of the West Bank. In yellow is Palestine, surrounded by walls. Everything else in green is Israeli.
2006, dark yellow, Palestine, light yellow, white, Israel in the West Bank. Two thousand seven, brown Palestine, white Israel in the West Bank. These are the same, basically the same maps. Here's another map. Then now people said, "Well, people don't know." This is published at the BBC. Later, we'll have things in the New York Times. So it's now known, getting known around the world, what the map is. Here's 2018. And if you remember, at the end of the Obama administration, John Kerry and Obama were very pressing to get a two-state solution because they said time was running out. And this is evidently the map. Barack Obama knew what the maps were. But when he was presented with this map, Israel, 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 Israel. He said, that's it. He said, I can't take it anymore. He said, time is running out. There's almost nothing left of Palestine to create two states. The idea is that Jews and Palestinians would live in two separate states and create bonds as states do, economic and political. Over time, other things might happen. But it's clear that Israel has had no intention of allowing a Palestinian state to be created. Now, this was just last week. This is the West Bank. Whoop. Israel, Israel, Israel. This is the same map. And Netanyahu, this is the New York Times, in a political sense, in his election, wants to annex officially this whole area of the West Bank. And of course, the embassy has been moved under Trump to Jerusalem, which is symbolizing Jewish control of Jerusalem, which Palestinians want joint control for their state too. So my Jewish theology of liberation, if you look at the covers, which I gave the ideas for. Here's a Jewish star only, actually from Ethiopia. Here, after the uprising, we have the Jewish star, but also the Palestinian kafia. And here we have the challenge, the symbol of Palestinian life right within Jewish life. Okay, coming to the final section. There are Jews, I call them Jews of conscience, which say no to this. They're Jewish. They're deeply Jewish. They, don't, they want Jewish power for us to be empowered and independent, but they don't want to use that power to oppress another people. This is part of a Jewish theology of liberation. We need to be liberated from being oppressed, but can we be liberated by oppressing another people? You say, well, just take the power. But the prophetic says... No, we can't be free unless those whom we oppress are also free. Then we can create a joint future. So this is a wall of photos that a Jewish progressive group made. And actually, there I am. That's, that's, I was almost going to send you that photo. I like that one. But here are all these Jews, including Albert Einstein, who was very afraid of a state of Israel as a Jew. By the way, I had a book, one of my books was reviewed with Einstein, a book on Einstein and Zionism, not on science. I got a very favorable review, and so did Einstein. So I've been reviewed with Einstein. And of course, Here's Noam Chomsky. Some of you have heard of him, I hope. How many of you have heard of Noam Chomsky? Very famous Jewish philosopher and politician, political activist, very much against, as a Jew, what the state of Israel is doing to Palestinians. Here's Buber, 
and we're going to meet some others that I know uh, personally. I don't know Einstein. Here's Judah Magnus, who was the first president, a chancellor of Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He was against the formation of a Jewish state. He wanted Jews and Arabs to live together in Palestine. Here's a take by two Jews on the new Ten Commandments. You will not kill, you will not starve others, you will not torture, you will not assassinate, you will not covet Palestinian land, you will not demolish homes, you will not uproot trees, you will not block ambulances, you will not besiege, end the occupation. The new Ten Commandments. Here's Dr. Sarah Roy, who's a friend of mine at Harvard, who is a child of Holocaust survivors. She's a world expert on Gaza. Why would a child of Holocaust survivors be supportive of Palestinian freedom? Amira Haas, an Israeli reporter who lives among Palestinians, she's also a child of Holocaust survivors. What's going on there? And here's my take. The violation that their parents faced, trauma that they passed on, cannot be healed when you oppress another people. In fact, the trauma of your oppression becomes worse. They want to end the trauma of their parents' generation. They want to end the trauma that Jews experienced and some Jews say, yeah, the way we do it is we take what we want. It's understandable. But these Jews are saying, that's just going to deepen our own trauma. This is making it worse. Stop the occupation. Stop the Holocaust, in a way, in my parents' life and in Jewish life. Let's be free together. There are Jewish-Israeli soldiers who refuse to serve in the West Bank or Gaza because they feel it's oppressing another people. They will defend the homeland of Israel, but they will not oppress others. Some of them are sent to jail. These are what I call Jews of conscience. Ilan Pape, whose parents were rescued during the Holocaust, has written a very important book, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. He's a Jewish-Israeli historian. And I met him a number of times, and the last time I met him, I have a very interesting story, which I won't get in completely. But he said to me, I knew he had read my book toward a Jewish theology of liberation. He's the most important Jewish-Israeli historian of our time. And I said, Ilan, what did this book mean to you? He's a secular Israeli. He said, I knew I could speak in a secular way, but your book gave me permission to speak for Palestinians as a Jew. That's a personal, very meaningful to me. But Jews have been very reticent. How can we speak about our abuse of power after the Holocaust? will be accused maybe of creating the context for another Holocaust. We want Jews to be weak. It's very complex for Jews to speak about our abuse of power. But here are Jews. Parents suffered in the Holocaust. Jewish Israelis who say, we cannot go this way. Here's Jeff Halper, who is an American Jew who went to Israel after the war after the 67 war, and has become a conscientious objector. I always tell Jeff, he grew up in Duluth, Minnesota, and he went to Bob Dylan's bar mitzvah. And I always say that that was the highlight of his life. But here, it's a joke, Jewish joke. Here he talks about the West Bank and Israeli settlements as not only settlements, but the matrix of control, a way of controlling the Palestinian population permanently. Noam Chomsky. Here are some groups 
who have formed now, if not now. These are very powerful young Jews, college Jews, many of them, who are saying we are demonstrating against Israeli and Jewish abuse of power as Jews. And open Hillel, because Hillel as a group has banned the discussion of boycott, divestment, and sanctions, which Palestinians have asked as a nonviolent way of resisting occupation, don't support corporations, businesses, militaries that benefit from the occupation of the Palestinian people. And Hillel as a group refuses that discussion. So some Jewish students started an open Hillel. They said, listen, whatever our opinions are as Jews, we have to be able to speak honestly. We can disagree, but we, some of us, believe that BDS is very important, and we have a right as Jews to say that. You can disagree, but you can't shut me up. Jewish Voice for Peace. Some of, how many of you have heard of Jewish Voice for Peace? How many of you have heard of Open Hillel? If not now. Okay. And here's the Jewish Liberation Theology Institute. Small, but it came from my book somewhat. Uh, in... Uh, and the, the subtitle or their slogan is Living Judaism in Solidarity with Palestinians. Some Jews say, that's crazy. That's not possible. And other Jews say, the other way is impossible. Ah, my synagogue. I joined the synagogue after many years. It's in Chicago, so I don't have to go to Sabbath services all the time. That's a joke. Okay. <laughs> Zedek Chicago, Justice. Rabbi Rosen was the leader of a synagogue in Chicago, very well paid, I believe, too, very prominent. And he read my book, and when he first read it, he threw, basically threw it up. He was so angry at me. And then a few years later, he read it again. And he said, you know what, I have to think about this. And then began to act upon it. He lost his congregation and started this on the side with others. And now he's become the full-time rabbi there. These are Jews who are non-Zionists. Some of them are anti-Zionists. Who have come together as a synagogue for justice on many, many issues, including Israel and Palestinians. And uh, last Yom Kippur, they invited a very prominent, very controversial Palestinian to address the congregation on Yom Kippur. The holiest day and the confessional day, inviting a Palestinian to speak, because that's what Jews need to hear, they believe, and I signed up. Now, the rabbi and I don't always agree on everything, but I'm a congregant, and when he admonishes me, I remind him that he's my rabbi. Okay, here's Jews of conscience. Solidarity with the Palestinians as a solidarity with Jewish history. What do we want to be as Jews? I speak as a Jew. I'm not a Palestinian. I'm saying to you what I want to be about as a Jew. I'm not telling Palestinians what they're about. That's for them to decide. 1948, when we created the situation of expelling hundreds of thousands of Palestinians, is central, not just 1967, when we went further. Even the creation of the state has to be questioned. Whatever you say about its existence, something happened that was profoundly wrong to the Palestinian people. We have to recognize the implications of Israeli power and that effectively, we control, as Jews, from Tel Aviv to the Jordan River. We have millions of Palestinians here, and here, and in Gaza, which we control. We occupy in different ways, and often in very bad ways. No return to Jewish innocence. We're not innocent. We're not terrible. We're not worse than others, but if you want to say better, you better act it. We're not. 
breaking with Constantinian Judaism. How many of you have heard the term Constantinian Christianity? Okay, that's when, you know, when Christianity was born, it was born of Jews, it was a dissenting Jewish group, and they were persecuted, sometimes by Jews, not often, not always, but others. They were looked at basically as a little bit uh, crazy. Let's face it. Maybe they were, who knows? But then in the fourth century, it became the religion of the empire, so under Constantine, so we call it Constantinian Christianity, and that's where it went around the world. How? By conquering others. We have a Constantinian Judaism, in my view. Constantinianism is when religion gets in bed with the state. The state grants its privileges to the religion. The religion says, amen to power. That's why in cities, maybe even in this city, you have churches in the center of the city. And in some lands of uh, Islamic background, you have huge mosques. They've made a deal. But we as Jews have also made a deal with power. Power will protect us, like the United States military. Israel will protect us. We will bow. We will bless it. We need to break with that. Jerusalem is not simply the capital of Israel. It's also the capital of Palestine. We have to begin to see Jerusalem as a broken place of two suffering peoples that can only be brought together when both are free, Jews and Palestinians. And revolutionary forgiveness. Okay, we're coming to the end. And this is a very important, I wrote a book on this, or parts of a book on it. It's titled Revolutionary Forgiveness. The idea, and this is how it came to me, Christians would always say, why don't you forgive Hitler and the Nazis? Sometimes very pointed. You hate Hitler in your heart. A Catholic sister said to me one time, don't you, Mark? I thought, when I think of Hitler, I think of a void. Not hate, but a void. But I had to for- think about forgiveness because Christians talk about it. By the way, Christians don't forgive in general, but they talk about it a lot. <laughs> and Jews don't forgive, but we don't talk about it. So let, give us credit. But since Christians are always talking about it, I had to think, what is forgiveness? Forgiveness is possible, I say, when justice is at the center. So here it goes. You meet in Jerusalem, the Prime Minister of Israel says, what we have done to you, the Palestinian people, is wrong. He doesn't have to say, or she doesn't have to say, we shouldn't have a state. I'm not even talking about that. But what we have done to you, historically, and what we are doing to you, is wrong. We want to change that. Well, the only way you can believe that that change is possible is by taking steps toward justice. Now, you have this memory. Jews have memory of suffering in the Holocaust and in Europe. Palestinians have memory of suffering from Israeli Jews. You keep those memories. Don't try to take them away, but you begin to work toward justice, creating new memories, right, of good of justice. And over time, those memories of the good and the just overcome the memories of suffering, which become more and more distant. Until in the end, when you've reached revolutionary forgiveness, an injustice against a Jew is an injustice against a Palestinian, and an injustice against a Palestinian is an injustice against a Jew. That's when you, reach, when you reach revolutionary forgiveness. We are very far from that. Gaza. Those of you who watch the news know. Israeli, there's been the great march of return where Palestinians have been demonstrating in Gaza for their freedom, and Israeli soldiers on the Israeli border have been shooting killing and maiming Palestinians. Remember Fackenheim's 
614th commandment, Hitler cannot win. This is my 615th. I figure if he can issue a commandment, I can too. Thou shalt not murder those who oppose your occupation. Or thou shalt not murder those who resist your oppression. Rabbi Greenberg's statement, my book on the burning children of Gaza. A woman, young woman, killed by an Israeli sniper, attending Palestinian wounded, a medic. Many Palestinians have been shot in the legs and lose their legs, amputated. There's a whole generation of Palestinians with one leg. Shot from, by snipers, Israeli snipers. Okay. Toward a Jewish theology of liberation, we as Jews cannot be free until Palestinians are free. Thank you.